politics and all that much more to enjoy. I want to begin with a question, kind of get us thinking where we're going this morning. Have you ever borrowed anything from someone? Maybe it was a tool, maybe it was a book, an item of clothing, a phone, uh, a ho- any of host of things. When you borrowed it from that specific person, from whomever you may have borrowed it, you knew when you borrowed it, you're going to utilize it for a while and then hopefully give it back, right? Because you know it's borrowed, it belongs to this other person, it's theirs. You see, that's the thing. It's not mine, it's theirs. I'm borrowing it for a while. This morning, I'd like for you to consider A second question. What do I have that belongs to God? Now just think about that for a moment. What do you have that belongs to God? It's on loan to you. You see, that's really where our lesson is going. That's that's the topic that I want us to consider. And the longer you think about that question, the more you may realize that there are a host of things you can put in there. host of things that you can include as you think about it. This morning what Luke does is he shares with us an encounter that Jesus has with some people that we learn are spies who set him up with a question. And this is just a few days prior to his crucifixion, prior to his death upon the cross. And he addresses an issue as they bring it up. And as we work our way through the events that lead to this question being asked, his response to it, I want us to think about our own lives and think about where we're at in our relationship with our God. And so by way of kind of setting the scene for us, What Luke does is he tells us that there is the Sanhedrin, the the chief priest and the scribes, they have reached a point at which they're, they're growing desperate. As a matter of fact, verse 19 kind of tells, follows what we've just seen with where they've tried to trap him. They've tried to challenge him on some things and he tells that parable, if you'll remember last week about the vine growers and as they, he tells the parable and all that goes with that, they realize he's talking about us. We are those vine growers. And this is about us. It's directed at us. And so, as Luke tells us, they were determined. They tried to seize him. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to do it right then and there, but he had become so popular with the people and that he was beyond their power to silence. They knew that if they took action against Jesus, that it was going to result in a riot. If you go back to the beginning of this week that we're reading about, to that Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, you may remember when we were studying that portion of Luke that the cry going up from the crowd as they're laying the palm branches before him and as he's riding in off of the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. The cry is, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And as all of this is happening, and as he comes into Jerusalem, the Apostle John apparently was able to witness something, saw it or heard it, and that is the Pharisees discussing amongst themselves and saying to one another, You see that you're not doing any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Everybody is following this man. We've got to find a way to get rid of him. But we've got to do it in such a way that it doesn't reflect on us. It actually falls back on him and it does not affect our position with the people. And so what they did, they watched him. And finally they, they send some spies. They're sending spies to do their dirty work. Because they know if we can trap him, in something that he says, and then take that and turn it around and present it to the authorities, the Roman authorities, they'll get rid of him. They'll do our dirty work for us because they will see him as committing treason against Rome and they'll want to take care of that. And so they choose these men, these spies, and these men, as we see here, 
as Edward read for us just a moment ago, they pretend to be sincere, or if you're reading from the New American Standard, they pretend to be righteous. I want you to focus upon the word pretend, because the word pretend, as it is from the Greek here in our text, comes from a word that you're familiar with. It's the verb form of the word hypocrite. When you hear the word hypocrite, what do you think about? just kind of bristles the skin, doesn't it? You see, it is a word that literally means to, pre, to play the hypocrite, which is what they were used to, especially in the plays of that day and time, because that was the term that was often given to an actor, a stage actor, someone who was a hypocrite. They're pretending, they're playing a part, someone that they're not, but they're pretending to be that individual. And so these men are pretending to be something they're not. They're pretending to be righteous, to be sincere, to be true people who truly care about what Jesus is teaching and want to learn of him. But their goal, as I said, is to take whatever he says, something that they can latch onto, and then to twist it around so that Rome will want to get with him. And they believe that this is the only way that we can get rid, rid of Jesus, get him out of our way, and then finally solve our problem problem that all goes back to this man, Jesus. So, after time, they come up to him and they attempt, first of all, to flatter him. Have you ever been flattered? Somebody just praises you immensely for something you've done or maybe for who you are. And that's what these men are attempting to do, to set Jesus up through flattery. And their praise is extravagant. I mean, they kind of go overboard. It's insincere. And the interesting thing is Jesus already knows what they're doing. Because we've talked about this before. You see, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew what was on their heart. He knew what their intentions were. If you go back, in Luke's gospel, go all the way back to chapter 6 of this gospel. You find there that Luke is telling us of a time when the scribes and the Pharisees on another occasion are closely watching Jesus to see if he would heal a man who had a withered hand and do it on the Sabbath day. And yet the thing that Luke tells us there in Luke chapter 6 and verse 8 is that he knew what they were thinking. He knew what they were thinking, what their intentions were. On another occasion, if you come forward to chapter 11, we have some more Pharisees. And this time, once again, they're demanding that Jesus show them a sign from heaven. But Luke tells us that they were testing him. And the very next thing he says in Luke chapter 11, verse 17, is that Jesus knew their thoughts. So these men are flattering him with the intent of trying to soften him up so that he might say something, he might slip up and say something that would catch him. Old Testament had a bit to say about flattery. It comes from the pen of Solomon. In the book of Proverbs, one of those is Proverbs 26, verse 28, in which he says a flattering mouth works ruin. Another one is from Proverbs 29, verse 5, where he says a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps, trying to trip him up, trying to get him to stumble and do something he would not do. The same is true here. They're trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to spread a net for his steps. They're trying to get him to say something that will come back to bite him, as we would say today, and hoping that he will do that. And what do they do? They praise him in his teaching. And they say three things about his teaching. They said, we know that you speak and teach correctly. In other words, you speak and teach what is right. You are accurate in your presentation. The second thing was, you're not partial to any. In other words, you don't defer to anyone. It doesn't matter if they're rich, poor, if they're well-known, popular, or not so popular, not known at all. You go back and look at the Gospels and what do you find? Jesus not only eats with the Pharisees, the religious, a, a religious segment of his day, but he also eats with what the Pharisees themselves called tax collectors and sinners. 
it, it, it didn't matter who they were because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. So he had a purpose. The third thing they say about him is that you teach the way of God in truth. You teach God's will in accordance with the truth. You show people how to walk in God's will. Well, folks, I'll be honest with you. Any teacher or preacher, if you were to say that to them, they'd say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate the compliment. Hopefully we all humbly realize that any abilities that any of us have, God has given them to us and he's the one that allows us to do what we do. But young people, if you have a teacher at school, don't try to flatter them in with the purpose of getting a better grade because I promise you it doesn't work. They've been down that road a time or two. So just be sincere in your praise, but not in the sense that I hope it'll get me a better grade this, this quarter or this semester, or however, you, however you work it. So they flattered him, and now what they're trying to do is trick him. And they ask him a question. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, you have to think about where they're coming from as they ask that. They're setting him up. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? They are a people living under occupation, Roman occupation. They despise the Romans because the Romans have control of the land that God had given to them, the promised land. The Romans determine what they can and cannot do. The Romans determine the taxes they are to pay. And so what they're asking, is it legal for a Jewish citizen, a worshiper of the one true living God, to pay taxes to a pagan government? Should we be doing that? In their minds, they've set him up. They presented him with a question that has an either or, yes or no answer. You either pay taxes to Caesar or you don't pay taxes to Caesar. Yes, it's right to do this. No, it's not right to do this. And they thought that they had done to him the same thing that he had done to them just a little while ago when they had questioned him about who gave him authority to do the things that he was doing. And he had turned it around on them and said the baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from men? And they were unwilling to answer that because they knew they, they had been trapped. And finally they said, we don't know. So they think they've got him. And you can just see the wheels turning. You can just hear their thoughts. Let's see you get out of this one. We've got you now. Because here's the way it would have worked. If Jesus had said that the law of Moses permitted taxes to be paid to Rome, then he was going to alienate those people who did not like the Roman occupation and who did not like the heavy tax burden that had been placed upon them. If, on the other hand, he said, no, 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 we are citizens of Israel. We belong to God. We don't pay taxes. We shouldn't be paying taxes to Rome. And he and they knew at the same time, Rome would see that as treason. They would immediately arrest him, and they would put him to death, and then it would be over with. How do you answer that question? How are you going to get out of this one? I find it interesting when you look at what Jesus does. Because he gives them, in his response, he first of all turns their question back upon them. And he says something simple. He says, show me a Daenerys. In Jesus' day, the amount required to satisfy what was known as the imperial poll tax, every individual was taxed this amount. This is just the poll tax, just because you live and breathe and you walk on soil you were to pay one denarius, a daily wage for a common laborer in that day and time. If you were to look at this denarius, and that's what Jesus asked, he says, whose likeness and inscription is upon it? You would find that on one side, 
you would find the image of Caesar Augustus engraved upon that coin. And around the outside edge, kind of like our coins have upon them, there was an inscription. There was something else there. And it was a Latin inscription because Romans primarily spoke Latin. But it was a Latin inscription. But if you were to translate it, here is what it would say. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. So it's claiming divinity for the emperor. You flip it over, and on the reverse side of that coin, what you would find is something else, another image. This was the image of Tiberius' mother, Leva. Inscription on the back side, Pontifex Maximus, which means high priest, declaring his mother to be high priest. Well, if you're a Jew who worships the one true God, I do not go along with that. I will not recognize her as the high priest. We have only one high priest, and that's Caiaphas right now here in Jerusalem. What's most interesting in all of this is that they had these coins on them. They had one of these coins, maybe more of these coins. The very coin that symbolized their subjection to Rome. You see, there was other coinage that was available to them. There was both the Judean and the Tyrian shekel that they could have used. The Judean shekel was what was used for them to pay the, the temple tax, which they had paid earlier because this was Passover week. And they could have worked with that coinage within Israel and, and just amongst themselves, but no, these men who have questioned him are carrying this coin upon themselves. Why? Because if you want to conduct daily business in, here in Rome, I mean, excuse me, here in Judea, then you have to use the Roman money because typically most of the business is Roman commerce in some way or other. Do you realize that those of us who go to El Salvador do not have to change our money into El Salvadorian currency? Why? Because they use the American dollar. The American monetary system is in use down there. A lot of places where you go the world over are trading in American currency. So you don't have to change your currency. That's kind of like it was in that day. You use Roman currency. It's, it's as, as what the credit card said at one time acceptable everywhere and so that's what's going on and when Jesus asked them whose inscription whose likeness is on it Caesar's he gives them a simple yet profound answer think about what he says he says first of all render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, the things that are Caesar's. Coins in Jesus' day were actually understood to be the property of the person whose image and inscription was on them. So what is Jesus saying? It's got his image. It, it's his. So give back to him what already is his anyway. They couldn't argue with that. It was his. It did belong to him. And if you go to Romans chapter 13, there in verse 1, the Apostle Paul even kind of expounds upon this, expands it a little bit, because what he says there is that every person is to be subject to the governing authorities. And then he adds that no authority ex is, exists except from God, and those which exist are established by God. God allows this government to exist, so it is our responsibility to pay our taxes. They couldn't argue with that. But then there's the second part of Jesus' answer, which is even more profound because when he said that we're to give to God the things that are God's, he's making a declaration. What he's saying is that God has total ownership. Give to God the things that are God's. What belongs to God? Everything. Cattle on a thousand hills, as the psalmist says, belongs to God. Everything. 
But let's bring it a little closer to home. You and I, each of us here this morning belong to God because we bear God's image. Go back to the very beginning of your Bible. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and work your way through the days of creation. And when you get down to day 6, you find God saying, let us make man in our own image. And in verse 27, we then find those words, then God did what? God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We are created in the image of God. We bear his image, every one of us. And the question that that brings now is how do I bear God's image? I want to suggest you, you could probably add many more, but just two that I want you to think about this morning. The first is this. You bear God's image simply because you exist. By your own existence, you are bearing God's image. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses is tending his father-in-law's sheep there in Midian. He sees a bush burning in the distance. He goes to inspect because it doesn't burn up and he wants to find out why. And of course, as you may remember, when he gets there, he's told to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground and God begins to speak to him and God tells him, I want you to go back to Egypt and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You're going to lead my people out. And Moses begins to give a number of excuses as to why he cannot do the job. And one of those things that he asked God that we find there in verse 13 is he says, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? What do I say to them? When they ask me what your name is, what am I supposed to say? And God responds, as you notice there in verse 14, with these words, I am who I am. And he said, say to, this, to the people, I am has sent me to you. Now think about that for just a moment. The fact that you and I exist. The fact that we are. That we have being. Is an indication of an all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God because you are His creation and you are created in His image. It says the psalmist declared over in Psalm 100 down in verse 3, it is He who made us and not we ourselves. Folks, there is nothing else in this world that has the same eternal spirit that you bear with inside of your body. A spirit that will live on even though your body will die and go back to the dust from which it came. That spirit will live on. And one day, if you are a child of God, you will be given a new body, one that is eternal. One that no longer knows pain or, or suffering or illness or all of the things that we succumb to in this day and time. And so we bear God's image in this way. But there's a second way that I want you to think about. We bear God's image in the way that we live our lives on a daily basis. Give you two things to think about just within that scenario. One is this, if you go to the Apostle John's first letter, you got 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. If you go to 1st John and you look down in verse or 5 of chapter 1, here's what you're going to find John saying. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Okay? God is light. No darkness in God. Well, let me take you to another spot. Paul writes a letter to the church at Ephesus. We call it Ephesians. 
And if you go to the book of Ephesians and you look there in chapter 5, Paul kind of touches on this same idea there in verse 8. Here's what he says. He says to the Christians there and to us here, you were formerly darkness. In other words, your lives were filled with sin. Your life was lived in sin. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. God is light. There's no darkness in Him. You were darkness. Now you are children of the Lord. You're to walk as children of the light. What is the fruit of the light? He tells us there the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. But another aspect of that walking in the light is that we try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So how do we bear the image of God? We bear the image of God by trying to be children of light. By trying to walk in the light as he himself, and that's something else that John brings out. Walk in the light as he is in the light. That's what we're doing. We're bearing his image by living lives that are righteous, lives that are good, lives that focus on what is true. We try to be pleasing to God. That's the way we bear his image. But there is another way that we bear his image in the way we live our lives. And if you go back to 1 John and you look over in chapter 4, there in verse 16, there's something else that John says there. He says, God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. God is love. And the one who abides, as he says, in love, abides in God. And God, in turn, abides in him. Remember what, well, let me, before I go that, let me take you just a little few verses back there in 1 John chapter 4. If you look in verse 7, John has already said this. He's just kind of adding to it with what he says there in verse 16. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And then he adds this, the one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So how do we bear God's image? We bear God's image by being a people who love those around us, who love God and who love our fellow man and who love our brothers and our sisters in Christ. As a matter of fact, in the upper room, prior to his, uh, his crucifixion, what does he say to his disciples? There in John chapter 13, John records it for us in verse 34 and 35. The new commandment Jesus said, I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And then he adds to this, by this will all men know that you are my disciples. Why? You have love for one another. So there are two ways. We bear the image of God first because we exist. We're created in His image. We walk and we breathe because we have a living soul. But we also bear His image as we walk in the light, as we try to live light, lives that are pleasing to Him, lives that are good, righteous, and true. We walk in the light, or, or excuse me, we also bear His image as we love one another, as we love God and we love those around us. And you see, the world sees that. And what Scripture is teaching us is that we're bearing God's image as we live these kinds of lives. If you look at the end, it's concluded with this statement. Luke just simply sums it up. He said they were unable to catch him in, say, in a saying in the presence of the people, and they were amazed at his answer. And because they were amazed at his answer, they became silent. I want you to notice that. They became silent. Why? Not because they were standing in the presence of the one and true Son of God. Not because they were standing in the presence of the Savior. But because they were impressed by His answer. They never, they, they never would have thought of that answer. That He would have come up with that. This morning as we conclude this study, I want to leave you with one final question. Have you given to God what is God's? I'm not talking about your money. I'm not talking about your time, your talents. Of course, all of that follows. I'm talking about yourself. 
have you given yourself first and foremost to God? Because if you give yourself to God, everything else follows. Do you love God this morning with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength? Because if you haven't started there, then you're not going to give to him the other things that you think are important to you, but really aren't. That's where we start. We start bearing God's image by giving ourselves to God. We bear God's image by loving Him and letting the world know that we love Him. Maybe you haven't done that. Maybe you're still holding on to a way of life that you think is going to satisfy, you think it's going to be fulfilling, but you're finding it's not as fulfilling as I thought. It's taking me down some roads that I don't like. Stop. Turn around. Go back the other way. We call that repentance. Don't keep traveling that same road of sin. Be willing to acknowledge your sin, confess it, and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be buried with Him in baptism. And let Him cleanse you. And let Him put His Spirit within you. And let His image begin to shine even more brightly in your life. If you need to respond to His invitation, we invite you to come as together we stand and sing.